Hi, hi everybody. Hey. Welcome to uh, the Wingly show, the Wingly update, the Wingly TBD. Is it already not TBD at this point? <laughs> We're not, it's not a TBD. We, we don't mention it. We don't mention it. <laughs> Eyal is not with us today because he's uh, vacating with his family. And so it's uh, me and Shai today. And so, hi Shai, what's up? How are hey, you? Hey, lad. <laughs> I'm good. Happy that I'm not a yell this time. <laughs> I see you have this uh, lovely background. Yeah, made with love by Amiel. <laughs> Amiel, who's Amiel? Uh, Amiel, he's our uh, designer. Uh, he's been working with us uh, for a while now, uh, just finishing uh, his uh, studies at, at uh, Bezalel, and now he's uh, joining us uh, full-time here in the team to lead all design-related uh, work and... Uh, It's like a, an amazing fit. Yeah. Uh, no, it, now, now we're going to have like lots of like new stuff coming up uh, all the time, which is really yeah. fun. There's, he also did the, the, the intro uh, video, which we all, yeah. we all really like. <laughs> Puts us in the right spirit for the beginning <laughs> of the show. Uh, and yeah, so now there, there are no more excuses for, uh, for not having awesome UI. <laughs> so what's going to happen today? What, what are we going to do? Uh, we're gonna start off with a chat with, uh, with Adam Jacob, the creator of uh, System Initiative and Chef, and it's gonna be a very interesting uh, talk. We're gonna talk about his journey and about System Initiative and where, uh, what, what we see similar and, uh, and, and where, where our views differ. Um, then uh, we're gonna have the, the wing length change log, uh, third time, uh, seems like it's gonna stay with us. Um, and uh, we're gonna finish with uh, with Chris talk about uh, wing modules and libraries which is a huge uh, building block for us um, we're super excited to to have this yeah can't wait to like start publishing libraries yeah cool so uh, without further ado um, let me bring in Adam hey Adam wow look at that there was applause yeah <laughs> we actually have like some fake applause somewhere no that's fancy yeah. <laughs> yeah we have like a very um high profile operation here obviously we just, uh, we're just using like the screen in front of us to create light proper lighting yeah uh, so that was like this uh today's uh new innovation in our studio it's a good um, move <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming man it's really yeah really my pleasure So um, I, I think what we, as, what we like to do is kind of like start by getting some early, as early as you want background, uh, kind of like, I'm always super curious to hear those stories and, uh, you know, yeah. journey. Yeah, I mean, look, the short version is that uh, when, I was a little, when I was a kid, I liked bulletin boards, if you remember bulletin boards. Mm -hmm. And then like bulletin boards were the coolest yes. thing about computers, which then sort of leads you directly to the internet. At least in America. Did you have like? A, were you were you owner of like a BBS? Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. I ran my first bulletin really? when I was like eight. Really? Um, yeah. Oh my god, I I love those. I I, I was love, I, I was totally bulletin. into that. I was totally into that. Yeah, I'm a little upset that they're gone. Like every once in a while, I still like like fire up something and go play trade wars. <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I mean that led me. Sorry, what? No, it's gonna be a new retro thing soon. It, yeah i think it probably already is to it some probably degree, already you know? is. i'm sure there are uh... yeah um now, now you got me to like go search for something okay yeah um so yeah i like but that led me to being a systems administrator and sort of the early eras of the internet and then you know my career has sort of just followed the problems that have happened as we've grown bigger and bigger you know like initially the problem was how do you get people on the internet and Then the problem was, what are they going to do when they're on the internet? And so we all started building applications so people could do stuff on the internet. And then we were like, hey, wouldn't it be great if what you did on the internet was hang out with other people? And so then it was like Facebook and mm -hmm. like social media. And, you know, so at each of those stages, there's been some kind of, and then we were like, shouldn't all of the enterprises all over the world, shouldn't your bank work just like the internet works? You know, and so like over and over and over again, we've just keep finding things. interesting new problems and so yeah my career has mostly just paralleled those problems where it's been like okay whatever the whatever is interesting and is sort of next then 
then you sort of tackle how to figure out how to make it work. Um, and yeah, for me, that's mostly looked like operations and systems administration stuff. And it turns out what I like to do is write, I like to write software for those people because that's kind of who I am. <laughs> the, 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 the inner BBS child. Yeah. The systems administrator, the operations person, the, the, you know, like, um, you know, both with chef and with system initiative, it's, it's like, I write software for people who build infrastructure or who think about applications or, you know, but I'm, but I tend to be thinking about the holistic, the technology that runs the technology as opposed to like, you know, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't build like StreamYard, you know? <laughs> yeah, I see. Total. Of course I know. And, uh, I... Yeah. Cause you are here and you build wing <laughs> and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Cause you <laughs> exactly. build tools for people who build tools, who use tools. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. But I have to say, it's pretty interesting because I, I was also, I also started programming in the kind of late eighties, nineties. Yeah. And, and I was always very attracted to like library and framework design and object oriented yeah. programming and kind of like basically constantly thought about the applications and, and how you're, how you're designing applications, which is really, I've, I've never uh, ran a BBS board, right? Like I used to connect to, to, to some, yeah. but I've never, so it's interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. It just depends on, you know, like, I think it's just a, it's the same part of your brain. It's just lit up in a slightly different way. You know? <laughs> you know, like one version of it, it's like, how are we connecting all the things together and figuring out how the pieces work under, like more under the hood? Yeah, and then yeah. the other one is like, how do I build something that people can use? You know, and like I was doing that too, but it was mostly like, you know, generating characters for Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. <laughs> but where I was spending most of my time was like actually figuring out like how it worked because that's what I liked. I liked the, I liked how the insides worked, you know? And you said that uh, that you were drawn to the operational side, mm -hmm. writing software for that. I think, like early on, it wasn't so much software. I think you probably are one of the pioneers of writing software for uh, for operations. Yeah, I mean, it was always software. We just didn't <laughs> talk about it that way. So you know, like when you if you were around, you know, if you've written like a send mail configuration file especially before m4 that this is like your audience is like what's he talking about and it's like, this is the way that like email this entire conversation is basically not targeted not for our audience yeah cheers <laughs> yeah i'm such a good i'm such a good guest um <laughs> you know like send mail was like had a very incredibly complicated configuration syntax that allowed you to really tersely define how different mail transport formats interoperated. So you could like translate between email and like pack mail to talk to a bulletin board or to be thrown over UUCP. And like, it was great at that. It was incredible, but it was so hard to understand. And so if you were a person who mastered send mail, like the book for send mail was this big, <laughs> like, and it was every ounce as complex as learning how to program in C. Like I still have a copy of like the KNRC book is right back there. It was like this big <laughs> and like, like which one is programming and which one's not, you know, yeah. like, I think yeah. when you, when you think about it from the, op, from the point of view of systems people, like that, that separation was actually sort of at the root of what brought us to DevOps because we had sort of convinced each other that there was a Delta there. And the truth was that there wasn't a Delta there that, that in fact, all of us were programmers the whole time. The only difference was what kind of language are we working in? What kind of problems are we trying to resolve? Um, and how do we solve them? But we had created this artificial gap between systems administration and operations folks and software developers, which to be frank, usually had software developers at the top of the pile and systems administrators at the bottom. Um, and for me, that's one of the reasons I started building great tools for systems people, because I just, that, that was always bullshit. Um, it remains bullshit today. Um, if you're a great operations person, there are skills that you have and things that you can do that a fabulous software developer who doesn't know anything about how operational things work can't do. Um, and in both cases, you're software developers. Um, you're writing software. Um, they're just different kinds of software uh, for different purposes. So, so interesting. Because I think that... This is why I, you know, I built a CDK, right? And a CDK yeah. comes from the, that, that exact 
uh, way of thinking is like, we're all developers, everything is software. There's no reason why infrastructure doesn't have to be, you know, doesn't have to be uh, treated the same as any other software piece of, that's part of the system. Yeah. And I still think so, right? Like I do 100% agree with you that everything is software, but yeah, I do think there are different problem domains. Totally. I think different software engineers deal with, you know, different software engineers in the different layers deal with mm -hmm. a very different problem domain, right? Like the totally. Developers who build the applications, they're focused on the problem domain of the business, right? Like that's their sure. world and that's the mental model. That's the, you know, this, the problem solving they're doing is at that level. Mm -hmm. And engineers that are working on the infrastructure side or in the operational side and the platform side are dealing with a different problem domain. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I, that's how I see it. So I think like, yeah, and I think you're, I, you're whether yeah. those are developers or not, or those are not because I 100% agree. Yeah. I think you're, I mean, I, I mean, you're manifestly correct, right? So like, <laughs> like it's like, like it's difficult. That's, to, that's like, how I like to be correct, basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, like, however, like here's the rub, I think, which is that the, the focus, I think we got the focus a little off. So, you know, if you looked at the first round of DevOps tools, we really embraced the idea that what we were all doing was, was automating the way that we worked. So we were looking at the way we worked. So we we're looking at the way application developers worked. We we're looking at the way operations people worked. We were putting those people together so they collaborated better and more. And we were trying to automate that process so that that collaboration was made easier. And in the end, you'd be able to ship software faster, more stably, more reliably, more securely, right? I think what we learned is that the shape that we chose to automate was the wrong shape. Um, because it's not like any individual tool was a bad tool. They're not. They're all actually kind of great. But if you look at the results people are getting in the enterprise, like one of the reasons there's an opportunity for Wing or for a system initiative is that if you go talk to people about how they feel about the end results, they don't love it. <laughs> they're like agree. they're 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 having a bad time and, right. and like, they feel they feel something's wrong but they don't really know what they can't really tell you what it is right and there's a really great bill Hader video which uh where he explains that like when you're doing comedy people can point out why something isn't funny or why it's not right but they're and they're usually right that there's something wrong in that zone but they're wrong about the solution Mm -hmm. um like all the time and this is basically the same here too it's like yes there's a problem we know there's a problem the question is like what are we going to do about it my supposition is that it's that the problem is systemic that the shape of the way we decided to work what we wanted the properties that we knew brought about good outcomes um started with collaboration they started with how do we bring those application developers and those people who have operational expertise closer together so that the work they're doing feels more holistic and gets delivered together in one move. And then we made a bunch of software to try to do that by just automating the way that they worked nearby each other, <laughs> you know? Um, and we were like, and, you know, you can see it in can the way we Can you give some examples? Can you give some examples? Yeah. Like the, the normal point of collaboration uh, in most people's DevOps workflow is the pull request review. And it's actually right there in the name. It's code review. It's not code collaboration. It's yeah. code review. Like somebody does it and then you tell me if it was good or bad, right? Um, and, and I think when we think about the separation between application developers and operations folks, the truth is the end result is the same. Like, if you remove the operations people from the equation, there's no app, there's nothing for the application to run on. If you remove the application developers from it, then it doesn't do anything. And so there's no point in having infrastructure. It's just computers, which are, I guess, like, fun, but <laughs> not really yeah. useful. And, and so- Only the, the fun, only the fun. I'd be surprised yeah. all the companies that are selling their, uh, their internal uh, infrastructure to other companies. <laughs> sure, right, yeah, exactly, yeah. All, to do nothing. So, <laughs> so like, I think, I, so the example there that I give is that like, when you think about how we work, like asking a developer to go read a bunch of Terraform to better understand what's about to change for their application as it deploys is not a good loop. It's not good for the application developer. They don't understand it. They don't understand how the infrastructure works. They don't understand the impacts of the plan. The feedback loop is really long. You know, maybe it, it might take you 30 minutes to know if you got it right or wrong, because it has to like 
churn through the actual AWS to do it. The plan tells you lies, all kinds of shenanigans you have to go through to sort of make that stuff work. And the, and those foundational choices that we made early on that said, Hey, the way we're going to represent this infrastructure is as code, or we're going to break the platform piece separate from the application deployment piece or separate from the way that we do these other pieces. Those things are actually, I believe what's, what's actually causing the bad outcomes. It's not a technology question of like Terraform sucks, therefore the outcomes are bad or, you know, whatever Jenkins sucks. That's why your pipelines are not good. Like it's not that it's actually that the way we've assembled the whole shape of the workflow is wrong. And we need to change that workflow if we want better outcomes. Um, and I think one of the things I like about wing is that, you know, whether you, whether you phrase it that way or not, I think there's this recognition that, that there has to be a different user experience to solve this problem <laughs> that like changing the workflow of the user experience is the way that we're going to figure out what, what's better. Um, and, and I think we're both making bets like that, that say, Hey, let's fix this user experience and that will go a long way in getting to better outcomes. So how, how do you envision, let, just describe like the, what would be the user experience of someone, the, the team, you know, the workflow for teams using system initiative, like how would that? Yeah. Be? So, so we think about it as essentially it's, we took a long time to build system initiative. So it took us like four years. So we've built a lot of, of different things that we've been trying to figure out how to make it work. So we didn't just build one thing. It's not like we started with the right vision four years ago and then got there. It was a lot of wandering in the woods while we, because our goal was to really change the outcomes. So where we landed was that in order to fix the biggest problem, which is feedback loops, and inference. So the two biggest problems we think are, are how long it takes to understand if you've done something, if it's right or wrong, and then right or wrong is dependent on your environment. So like there's, it's one thing to say that a configuration is wrong canonically. It won't work. Right. It's another thing to say it's wrong at Citibank or it's wrong at Ford or it's wrong at Facebook or it's wrong at wing. Um, yeah. and you need to be able to do both. Um, and you need to be able to see that feedback in as close to real time as you possibly can. So, how quickly can we know that that's right or wrong? So that led us to essentially building a simulator that allows you to model what's possible and then say, what are the rules that, uh, that need to be applied? And rather than actually doing it, um, if we make the model high fidelity enough, then mm -hmm. that model can tell you in real time that you're right or wrong um, and that it meets your policy or doesn't. And then the other piece is you need to be able to think about um, how configuration gets inferred. So if you think about how much we have to repeat a single piece of configuration across multiple layers of the stack. So a, a great example I use is how do you know what port an application is running on? So uh, you put the application in a container, you decide it's running on port 80. Um, now you want to deploy it to Kubernetes. So yeah. we need to thread that port number through from the Docker container to the Kubernetes oh, deployment. To the values, to the Helm chart, to the, the Helm chart, to the to the ALB that's in Azure, to the, right? Um, and, and the syntax there is also different. So the way you express it in, in Docker is like 80 slash TCP, but yeah. that's not how you express it in a Kubernetes manifest, right? You deploy that, that's got a totally different shape, which is different yet again from the shape that you express it somewhere else. So it's not only that that value must flow, it's that that value must be translated to mm -hmm. semantically across match those yep. across those layers to the places it needs to match. Um, so we think about that simulation as essentially a gigantic graph, um, that has multiple layers in time and at each point in the graph, which is as low as like a single property, what you're doing is running a function that generates a value. Um, and then you can have essentially think about it as like sockets yeah. that will then flow that data through where you can translate it. You can change it. You can infer values, right? Mm -hmm. The side effect is that you can really quickly compose those models together and they'll keep their configuration correct and then they'll generate the code from the model. So rather than starting as infrastructure as code where you write infra where you write code, the code defines what the world looks like and you do it. Instead, what you're doing is defining a model and then the model derives what the right code would be um, for whatever the domain is and then keeps it up to date because it understands what to do. 
And then the last bit is uh, you have to track the real world state of the resources that get created. So if there's any, sometimes, you know, sometimes you're talking about concrete things like I want to manage an EC2 instance or I want to manage a Lambda function or whatever. And sometimes it's abstract. This is my application, right? There's no such thing as the application. The application is like a conglomeration of all the stuff it needs in order to run. Of course. So what, how we think about it is you model all of those things in system initiative. Um, and the, and then when it comes down to those concrete resources, we're also tracking those concrete resources over time and then letting you reconcile between them. So saying, Hey, your model said that this resource was supposed to look this way, but it doesn't. Um, and do you want to change it? Do you want to update that resource? Do you want to, you know, and that maybe that operation is, it is whatever it is, however the, however the domain models it. Um, or it may be that the model, the resource is actually correct. Somebody was troubleshooting. So they logged into the AWS console and they clicked a button that fixed a bug. Um, mm -hmm. So instead of having to destroy that or have your automation turned off, which people do all the time, right? Oh, we're firefighting, turn off Terraform, figure it out, <laughs> fix it, then go write it in the code, then redeploy move it. Move away, move away. <laughs> exactly. Here, um, we would essentially just let you change it however you wanted to. And then we would just look at the resource and notify you in the UI to say, hey, these two things aren't in sync. One thing you could do is change it so the resource is in sync with the model, or do you just want to update the model? Um, and then like problem solved. So, um, and yeah, that's, that's system initiative in, in kind of in a nutshell. And the, the core of it is that, that in order to fix what is wrong systemically, we needed to change the way we think about modeling that the, the system altogether. Yeah. So like when you say you like, who's the persona that uh, you target to use to use system initiative? Is it um, the DevOps engineer, the, the application engineer, both? Yeah. Um, what's the flow like? Yeah, I mean, it changes a little over time, right? So today, system initiative is new and like rough around the edges. And so who it's really ready for today are just innovative DevOps engineers who heard the description I just give, I just gave, and they were like, that sounds and fucking fell cool. in love And fell in love. Yeah, and if you want to come hang out and it's open source, you can come hang out with us and build it. Like, let's go. Um, so it's ready for those yeah, people Sayuda now. Sayuda is uh, just open source it, right? Yeah, we open sourced it last week. Um, all the software is open source. Yeah. Every line of it's open source under the Apache license. Uh, always will be. Um, the, um, yeah, so, so that's what it's really, yeah, that's what it's ready it's, for today. Go ahead. Um, but eventually it'll be, it'll grow. So because you have all this data in the model, um, and because it doesn't matter, you can model anything you want, like it will eventually grow to do all kinds of stuff because there's all sorts of valuable information in there. What will change is the interface. So if you think about the jobs that we do and how we collaborate, there's not one universal interface that makes sense for every job that's involved in that full cycle of how do we get an application out to production. So, you know, the way that a develop that a DevOps engineer interacts, they're caring more probably about the infrastructure. Application developers care more about the application. They probably care more about things like deployment. They care more about test coverage. They care more about all kinds of other information. So over the time, the interface grows and changes to sort of accommodate different personas. It's, it's, it was, this, was, this was extremely fascinating because I feel like we actually, in a sense, Wing is building this exact same this exact same um, architecture, right? It's mm -hmm. basically you create a model of your cloud application. You'd model all those resources and all, your, all those nodes. And each node has like relationships to other nodes. Yeah. Uh, and some code that represents their, you know, their, their behavior and also a composition model where you can like take multiple, multiple of those resources and create higher level abstractions from them. Yep. And then you, and then you synthesize configuration, right? Like this, the, basically right. when you're compiling a weak program, you're, you're going all over this tree and you're synthesizing the configuration. It could be any totally. So I think like there's lots of like basically the same architecture in, uh, for the yeah. systems, which is really and, interesting for me. And I, I mean, it makes sense, right? Because if you sort of think about the history of, of our space, the like, there's only so many threads to pull on. Correct. And so it's, it's 
the your recognition and my recognition of the same sort of feedback loop problem and the like abstraction and synthesis problems like those are just those are the problems and if you're committed to solving them you know like the you end up with, uh, yeah we end with up the with the simulator yeah you end up with the you end up with similarities and what's diff like the differences are interesting and 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 meaningful but like but it's not surprising to me that there's more sim that there's more similarity there than there is difference because if you're if you're thinking about you know um like joe at palumi for example i think like had a very similar point of view has had a very similar point of view about how palumi might have evolved in a different in a different universe palumi could have looked a lot like wing right yeah and um and i think the i'm not sure that the universe was ready for palumi to look like wing Mm -hmm. for example <laughs> so like totally, if you think, totally i mean that's like, when i that's when i released the cdk right like at that yep. exact same and, month and, and so you wind up in this interesting you wind up in this interesting spot where evolution evolution of designs evolute evolution of layers and abstractions right like it's kind of like this organic um process it evolves like art it's mm -hmm. always we're in conversation with each other over a long period of time on the art of how this can work. Like it's art. Yeah. Like I'm, yeah. I learn from you, you learn from me. We learn from Joe, yeah. we learn from Mark Burgess, from Luke Gany. Like there's this huge long line of people and you know, like you, you, you take those, you take those inputs and what it comes out as is art. Yeah. Any, you know, it's a good sign for both of us that architecturally it wound up being roughly similar because what it means is we're probably right that that art is somehow compelling. More, more right. More right. Yeah, a, little, a little more right. We're more right than we were before we had this conversation. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because, um, and, and I think that really just points to this need for this like second wave of, of, yeah. of DevOps tooling. Like yeah. when I, the thing I most want to see, like, of course I want system initiative to like be the biggest business I can turn it out to be. And I want people to love the product and I want all that stuff to happen. I, but like, I also really just want to see all the different ways people will build new stuff when they realize that they can build new stuff again mm -hmm. and that there's, and that changing some of those fundamental yeah. building blocks is actually quite achievable and yeah. can really be different in the way that like, yeah. like the outcomes can be really different than what we've had before. Yeah. And, you know, yes, it's riskier because you might be totally wrong. There might be things that you don't understand. Like, but I don't know that we need another like like a le like a slightly better CDK. I just don't. But what what would it do? Like um, <laughs> we've we've pushed on that angle for like a while, you know. I agree. I agree. And um, and so we just need we need people pushing on new angles um, if we want to see like really outsized uh, changes. And I feel like I want to say hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. No. Right. I totally. I, it's I, it's also really. I love it, right? Like I agree. I agree. It's it's this is this is it's kind of like this beautiful thing that happens. I it, it I actually had the same experience with Pulumi mm -hmm. uh, when we released the CDK the same month Pulumi released their beta, and I was like, oh my god, these guys are. What happened? Like, they, were they in the room? <laughs> it felt it felt really odd to be honest, right? Like, and I, yeah. it was the first time I felt this. This this kind of like you get to the well. It's 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 all about problem solving eventually, uh, and I feel like uh, we're trying to crack problems. This is this is what we do, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying to kind of solve for many constraints that are like accumulating over time. And um, and you came from similar backgrounds. You were both out we're of both geeks, geeks in the eight, <laughs> in the nineties. Well, but you and Joe, like I think in particular, have like a lot of background overlap, right? Like yeah. like language design. Like, like there's like the, like you're very, like have really similar backgrounds, but like, yeah, I also yeah. feel like I learned a lot at Microsoft, you know, I, I spent some time at Microsoft and I feel like I really, there was a, something about Microsoft. There is something about Microsoft's proficiency in like designing developer tools and, and frameworks and libraries and API design and class totally. library design. And I think that's totally correct. Right. I feel like that's, uh, yeah. I mean, as an outsider, I always felt like the the people that i've known who were great at microsoft like part of what made them great was that they were they were they were very willing to like go to the fundamentals if they needed to 
they were very willing to be like, well, we could write a new programming language. Is that what we need to do? Like, do we need to write, like whatever it is they needed to do, they were willing to go do it in a way that like other organizations often will hesitate. They'll be like, well, maybe that's too hard or it's too complex or we don't understand it. And like Microsoft does, I think have a pretty solid history of finding a way to do that. And I think, you know, hopefully now as we like, as we sort of build this second wave of DevOps companies, like if we can figure out, you know, we have more in common. <laughs> We're more alike than we are different. We have more in common than we than we don't. And I think the, you know, what we need to figure out how to do is like, how do we stay in conversation with each other so, exactly. that, so that those things do get pushed forward uh, and those good ideas do come out and we can express them to the world in a way that's like, hey, we did actually learn that like, that there is something really important about the idea that what we're doing is 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 essentially building simulators that then like generate the configuration or generate the outputs or generate synthesize yeah. the results like it's just an interesting idea and it's yeah. one who I think, like it, I think an area we can definitely think talk about collaboration is is specifications you know like open yeah. specifications for different layers because i do think that there are i i do believe that you know different uh problem domains and different types of engineers they they like to use different tools right like they have a different yeah. their brains are wired differently and i think like it's really interesting to see those two solutions kind of like coming from you know two different paths to very similar results uh, but I do think that there is something about the, the the interface, right? Like what interface you're using, and like you said, it, different different people would want different interfaces. And I think it would be really interesting to try and uh, yeah, collaborate. Yeah, I think you have to think about, you know, as we as you as we build and we do more. Like, you know, it took us a long time to build System Initiative, and I know it took you a long time to build Wing. Um, and not as long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um. Um. But like, I think the, um, you know, it's going to take the people who come after us less time, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, they'll no, have and, also, and, and I think also at. acknowledging that, there, that there's an ecosystem, right? And every layer, there's always an ecosystem. And if the layer totally. is like well designed in terms of like collaboration in, around the industry, and it's usually about like specifications and standards, that's eventually the way you're able to create these like collaborative, you know, this decentralized uh, initiatives uh, work together. Yeah, for sure. I also think there's just like a pure, there's just a pure community building question, which is like one way that this goes as, it, as things happen over time is that, you know, people love what they love. They love wing, they love system initiative. They love, they love Pulumi, like whatever it is that you love. Um, and the way that folks like us relate to each other informs the way our communities relate to each other as well. Right. So, you know, if we like each other and, <laughs> and we can, and we like respect what we're doing for each other and we respect the way that each other are approaching the problem, then our communities become communities that respect each other and respect the way that they approach the problem and like whatever they can talk about their where they disagree or where they diverge in ways that are, are, are kind and sort of move the the needle forward for everybody. Yeah. Um, and hallelujah, <laughs> we need like a... that's the way. So absolutely, absolutely. So maybe let's uh, kindly discuss a bit how uh, where where we diverge. Uh, so far, we've uh, just talked a lot. I think. Do we have time? I think we might need to like get Adam to. Would you be interested in? Yeah, I'm sure we'll keep in touch. And yeah, I think we can we talk about over it. time almost. Yeah, I'd love to. Of course. So we can uh, discuss uh, divergence uh, in the. Uh, oh, definitely, we should. In, in the next, in, in a future episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like we could absolutely talk about it because the like it's not like we haven't thought about it yet. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to talk about how we diverge. That's what's gonna be really interesting to yeah. more viewers. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Cool. Uh, any parting words? No, I mean, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks for coming, man. It, uh, oh, my pleasure. It's really a pleasure. And I, I'm a fan of the way you, you know, talk about our industry and what we're doing. And I wish I, I had more, I don't know. I wish I was better at that. Uh, you seem but, pretty good uh, at it so far. I'm, 
<laughs> not really. <laughs> but uh, but it's but uh, I knew it's going to be a you know really fun conversation. I love all the anyway the the, the shared value system. I think like that's for sure. really fun to see and uh, looking forward for like collaborating. Definitely. See you later. Thanks. Okay, see you later, man. See bye you. bye. Bye. Okay, that was super interesting. Um, I think it's uh, exciting in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay, so um, we have some music coming up, and then Mark Mark is going to give us his changelog uh, segment. Ooh. Bye. Bye, Shai. Uh. 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 Knocked his ass out and kissed him on the cheek. Uh. Fucked up just by thinking I was sweet, huh? I uh, run the city, might have thought I was some cleats, huh? Ain't never heard someone like this up on the beat, huh? Tootie, fruity, the booty, duty is jewelry, duty. Moody, foodies, jacuzzis is filled with bougie booties. All of this money don't know how to count it, man. I think I need a computer. I can't live in deep, man. I live at the funeral. I got the... Shai, we can see you. <laughs> 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 uh, so, uh, uh, wait, don't we have like the, the thing for the change log? Come on, Mark, go away. <laughs> and also, I also said goodbye to Shai. Mark, Mark doesn't like threesomes, he just likes like two people. <laughs> no, I know, but I thought like Dana, don't you have the control? Dana is not in control. Up. Okay, so oh, Shai, right. see you later. Wait, so see, I'm gonna it? log off, uh, and uh, was... we'll, we'll uh, get Mark to uh. <laughs> It was a pleasure. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Why not? Go, go for it, Dana. Hello, world. Hello. Okay. That was a. That was that was something. That was a shit show. That was <laughs> that was that was a mess. <laughs> uh, I loved it though. I prefer a mess. I don't. I mean, I don't yeah, think a well-run show. Sorry, is for ahead. anyone. I don't think anyone wants to see like a well-oiled machine. It's I mean, not really that. that uh, I would read a book if I wanted to do that. <laughs> I would go like, <laughs> that's not. I'm not here for. A, that's not I'm the not format. <laughs> no, I want. I want goose. I want gaffs. I want laughs. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no, I think it's. Um, Eyal is not here, so we're struggling, but we're we're doing our best, basically. So what's up, Mark? I'm I'm hanging out. I it's uh what is it? It's two thirty. It's two thirty eight p.m. here, and I've had I the only I've had coffee and I ate cake today. Okay. But I feel like shit right now. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. But and I'm still excited that, to do. After that, you're after, gonna have some lunch. Uh, maybe more cake. I'm just kidding. I'll try to. <laughs> I made ropa vieja yesterday, which I don't know if you had that, but it's very good. Mm-mm. What's that? Uh, it's like a, I think it's a Cuban dish. It's like a, it's like a stewed meat. With, it's like tomato and mm. spices. And, uh, and a- yet I ate cake today. That's what I mean. <laughs> I have that. I have that ready and I ate cake instead. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> so you want to walk us through the last two weeks of uh, new stuff and drama happening in the Winglang world? Uh, I can do the first part. Okay, not, no drama. I don't no know which drama is we're there not, a drama? We're not, not relicensing Wingling as a no. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, we won't talk about that now. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah uh, I, I have it shared. It's ready to. Oh, uh, there we go. There, go. there it is. Um, so, even though I, I feel crappy, I'm ready yeah. to do this. I'm excited. Uh, same format as last time because why not? I already did all that work. I'm going to reuse it. I'm not sure what I'll do it again, though. I might try something else fun next time. Unless I don't feel like it. You should. In which case, have, I you published, have you published it? It should be like open somewhere. It, uh, I should. I have not. <laughs> but I will. I, Adana's already asked me to do, uh, to do it. And I, it's a good idea. Especially with this, you can like, you can even publish it as a site, too. Like, it can be even in the. I love it. Blog or something. I love it. But, uh, but yeah, here's the next entry since the last uh, the last Wingly, except for the first one, which I actually want to call out a change from Marcia that was in, it was technically in last time, 
but I just I just think I just I just didn't see it. I mean, I knew it was changed. I just didn't I didn't mention it. Uh, so I but I definitely want to call it out that we now have uh, variadic arguments of both like the support for declaring it and consuming it within the language, uh, and that was a really really super important feature. And also sure. importing uh, JSIA libraries that use uh, variadic. Uh... Oh, you caught me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, the so the the reason I remembered it is because I was like, oh yeah, Chris added this, but wait a minute, I never mentioned that we added support for it in the base language itself. So yeah, we now it's also consumable from JSI libraries, which I feel like this might have been the last thing that made like JSI libraries were pretty widely usable, but I think this might have been the last thing that was like a blocker for some people in terms of some aspects of it. I, I may be wrong, but I I, I think that yeah. might be it. Yeah, uh, I, I, can't think of, I can't think of um, other uh, missing. Uh, so ba basically, now we support full full support for JSII uh, libraries, unless yeah. unless discovered otherwise. Unless we don't, I, we <laughs> do. Unless we don't, uh, you know, please file an issue. Contributions welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so yeah, we got we got those in. Super big deal. Uh, for some other changes, um, Muterey. I had some additional uh, APIs added. Well, uh, one from Ananthu is set. So being able to, uh, I had to go to the screen. Uh, to like, if you have an array and you want to change one of the values, you can take the index and the value and change change what value that is. In the I, love the, I love the meaningful example. Right? Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> and also, I love uh, that you're using, uh, you know, deep equals. Yeah, I, I think that was mentioned in the last... Um... I know, no, no, but it's like, I really love this feature. I don't know why. There's something about me that kind of like always resented the fact that it equals doesn't work like I, you would expect it to work, right? Like it's like... Yeah, I get, I get what you mean. It's like, oh, it just doesn't... It doesn't... Yeah, I, I, I feel you. So it is nice. It's nice that I was able to... I wrote this and I'm like, that's how it works. Like it kind of, they're equal, right? So they're exactly. equal. They look the same. I mean, of <laughs> exactly. course there's more nuance to it, but like they're equal, right? They're equal. Here you go. Yeah. Um, so, um, Hey, weeping clown 13. Uh, oh yeah. That's, uh, I always, I should ask people what name they want to put on here. Because Weeping Clown 13 is an Anthu. Anthu. Oh, hey, an Anthu. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I believe, so I believe it's him. Anyway, so the, but the next one. So now also we can blow his cover, basically. Yeah, I, so I also should have asked if he want me, wants me to blow his cover. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up was a change from Gary, who does not have an image on Slack or GitHub. Um, so I gave him one. He can let me know if that's an issue. Uh, <laughs> And uh, he added insert, which similar example, just you know, we want to insert in the in the tooth the tooth position, the tooth position. which is better than the second because it's zero one tooth. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's zero, maybe... it's zero base. You can't use it's... the second with zero. Base. Exactly. So it's the tooth. That's <laughs> uh, these are the kind of APIs where it's like, oh yeah, we you need to be able to do that for. For mutable arrays, it's kind of like a. Can you a, add like multiple items? Uh, I don't believe this is variadic, but it, we have variadic it, it argument support, be. so it could be. How did you say uh, that open issue, open issue, file bug uh, contributions are welcome? Uh, <laughs> uh, created issue contributions welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the slogan of a open source uh, <laughs> maintainer. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, big one, super big, super big stuff. Uh, so, JSON, as people may or may not know, JSON objects in, in Wing are kind of like uh, they're not statically typed, they're, but they only constraint on them is that they should they're a JSON compatible data structure. So it could be anything from uh, a number to a dense object, um, and there we had no way of without you writing yourself, oh, like something to convert from a dynamic JSON to a struct where the type is known, even though it should be possible. So uh, Hassan added 
the uh, from JSON method uh, static method to structs that will take a JSON and convert it with proper checking into the struct at runtime. Uh, this includes, you know, uh, errors as well in the case where it's like age should be a number and it's if it's given as a string, you get validation at runtime. It doesn't just explode. It gives you a, a proper error like you might get from a validation yeah, library. Basically, a JSON schema checking error. Exactly. Um, so this is pretty huge. I, I I wanted to fit better examples, but I wanted to also be short. But I mean, this is like crazy common to get data from an API. And you're like, I'm pretty sure I know what the type is, but I don't want to just be stupid and assume it's a certain thing. And I, I want the validation layer in there. So extremely common use case that so super important to have. Yeah. Um, no Definitely. words for it other than this is important. I think yeah, <laughs> it's like no, a pretty. I think, not, not that it, I, th I think I I I'm I'm really excited about this. I think like that's uh, it, it's it's kind of like we've talked about it originally, but this is you know now we actually have that implemented. Uh, it's kind of like an area in in Wing that's like cloud oriented in a way, but not in the in flight sense, right? Like it's basically. These, this is stuff that we constantly do in the cloud and we want to be able to have the language, you know, intimately familiar with this, with these, uh, uh, with this process. Uh, so I'm super excited. And, and as I said, there's basically a JSON schema behind it. And so there's going to be, I don't know that uh, that's implemented already, but there's going to be person dot schema, which will basically return a JSON schema. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's implemented either, but I mean, the, the, the architecture is there for it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And then so. you can like use it to generate API specifications and like so think about generating API specifications using Wing struct. So basically just specify the struct and uh, so I'm super excited by this. Yeah, for sure. Same same for me. Um the next one looks related but is not. Um so a change uh I made this change, but I didn't want to put my picture on there because I <laughs> it's weird to do that. Uh, I mean, but I did already, do this. already on screen. That's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the corner. Um, so the the big change here was, uh, and here's an example of like a situation you might run to that you and you hate yourself because you you're trying to write all this this code and then partially this looks bad because you know we don't have like type aliasing or anything, so you have to keep writing out that. But even if we did, there's still right. Right, types right, like right. oh wow this is great that this pops up every time <laughs> um so that's still there so why can't my compiler do that Oops. why can't my compiler do that for me oh, nice. do the proper flip there you go nice uh so now the compiler can uh i'm gonna i'm gonna use the word infer but it's the compiler can figure out like okay this even though this looks like a json object it's actually a struct it's being used as one, and we can know that the types in it are correct. That's why I kind of said implicit structs, construction or JSON casting. This technically works even if your JSON is declared outside of this block. But I think this is the primary use case that we care about for, for that you would actually very commonly run to, in, into right. in many JSI libraries with any sort of nesting. Uh, and I think, and I think the fact that it works outside of this block makes it like I remember when you talked about implementing it. I didn't realize that this is the use case that you were uh, that you were thinking about, right? Like if I have a JSON thing and then I just put it uh, inside, is that there's an example? No, like the, the no, the, I don't, the, I don't have an example. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that it's actually doing static uh, structural typing type uh, comparison, right, between the two. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, I found it to be a robust solution, even though this is the actual problem I was trying to solve. Like yeah. this was the whole goal. But yeah, I, I, turns out I, initially I was like, I'm not, I wasn't sure that that would be my, yeah, I mean, I wasn't sure if that's the right solution, but I, I feel like that we will really like this capability eventually. I yeah, mean, to me, I, there's, there is something to be said about like the place that JSON and struct and like objects have in Wing, like maybe there's even some more mushing together. Uh, there is talk in the implementation of this. Uh, I think Chris brought it up that like a JSON literal and a struct literal are like the same, 
like and I'm and I'm and a map. I mean, the syntax is different, but like they're all objects. So it's there's some there's some maybe um, I don't know. There's some there's something there. T tighter relationships, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's not change. Awesome. Uh, you know where I knew, we know we know you know where the where I'm, I use it the most uh, for returning a result from an API uh, callback. Exactly, it works. It works there as well. I was going to put that example here, but I I liked the effect of the all the text yeah, disappearing. Yeah. No, this Kubernetes is great. stuff. Yeah. But yes, it works also for returns. Even so, it doesn't have to be within like a nesting. It can be anywhere where you're taking a JSON and trying to use it like a struct, basically. Um, so next up, uh, I wanted to call out a uh, first contribution uh, from Akil. Uh, to add an API to bucket called add file, which uh, I think it was like one of the, and I, I can remember from when I use CDK, that was like probably the main way I interacted with it from from what I didn't know was called preflight back then. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knew. It was preflight, but I didn't know that that existed because it didn't. Um, <laughs> but that was, it's one of the more common use cases. And now we have it as available as an API bucket as Beautiful. well. And, and there's this interesting thing here. Uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the path to the file is relative to the wing file. Uh, I actually don't know. I know, well, I know there's, there's ongoing discussion about this, I believe. Yeah. This there, there's a... this thing in wing there's this thing in wing that we that I want us to to support which is that apis can basically add a, an option that wing injects uh, transparently into the api that gives the api context about the source file right like where who called it mm -hmm. and and that and so you can implement something like that right and so now we have like a baby version of that. I don't know if you're familiar with this environment variable of like the entry point directory that we I believe I added I believe I added that. And I actually <laughs> kind of it actually but it's oh, caused problems. Yeah. It I, is it's actually thing. caused it's caused quite a few problems. And I, I know, uh, I know because we haven't we've never really finished the, the the project. I feel like we need to like add more built in support for something like that. And then it's gonna be really powerful. Yeah, especially now with it made a, it was okay when there weren't right. multiple entry points. Correct. It was added for extern, uh, right. and now it's now it's no no bueno. Oh, it was added <laughs> for extern. I thought it was added for a website. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's also okay. used by the website uh, API. Yep. Anyway, we're, we'll solve it. It's, <laughs> we'll uh, it's yeah, it'll, be, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It's actually something that's uh, really missing in uh, you know. In JavaScript, for example, you can't you can't design APIs like that. You can't design APIs that take relative paths to the to the to the consumer, right? The the, the code that consumes the API. Not not reliably, yeah. I mean, you can it's JavaScript, you can, so you can you kind can of do look whatever. At the stack trace. You can look at this. Yeah, stack trace. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, so last on the list, I I always seem to end with. Um, Oh, VS Code so or nice. you know VS Code console stuff, and I I always struggle because I'm like, how is it's like perfect already? Like it, everything's so beautiful and amazing, and they just keep it keeps getting better every time. And I'm gonna say it every time I think. But anyway, the feature added, added by great. poll was to so I think last time I talked about that now the console's pretty tightly integrated. It's into VS Code rather than kind of just being like a separate thing. It's it's in there. And an additional enhancement to that is now whenever you choose a theme, the color scheme within the console matches that scheme, not just light mode, dark mode. No. Nope. Which is good. At, honest, that was good enough. <laughs> right. I was like, that's what all I wow. was like, that's fine. Now it was like, oh shit. Now it's, it's literally the entire like palette matches. It's amazing. It's amazing. So that's it nuts. Looks, it looks Bring great. your own theme to, 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 to the console. The console. So, it, it is amazing. I have to say, it's like top notch. And I, there's there's a PR open for another console change, and like I can't wait to be say the exact same thing about that change. Uh, in in two because weeks, it's, no it keeps hints, going. No hints. No, because I forgot. But it, I was amazed <laughs> when I saw it. Like, <laughs> remove dot from title. <laughs> it's it's uh yeah, it's something that crazy. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and that's uh, that's the changelog. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. Do, do the theme again. I love the theme. <laughs> yeah, the changelog theme. I can't. <laughs>
but because we could, yeah. we could because we couldn't start with everything is private. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we <laughs> have to start from somewhere. Exactly. Um, so, and then importing it is kind of with this basic, you know, uh, it's with the com the bring syntax you might be familiar with, but you just specify the the relative file name, um, and of course you give it some kind of name, and then yeah, you can. What, oh, what was it? Store dot uh, cache. Yeah. Yeah. No, some of the LSP things like we're, we're getting, it's like 99% working, but there's always a few gaps. There's no, um, still no uh, doc completion for, uh, for modules. Yeah. But it does compile. Um, so that's all great. Um, yeah, okay. I don't know. There's some interesting things about entry point files and non-entry point files. Um, but... What What about that? Tell us, because uh, th that was exact, exactly what I was uh, I wanted to ask, right? Like in, mm. you talked about declarations, and uh, but there's also statements because in Wing you can actually just like write some code that just you know just runs in preflight. And so how would that? How does that work with uh, with modules? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think it comes down to understanding like what makes classes in Wing special, right? Um, you know, Wing pre-flight classes, or th there's kind of like these two flavors of classes. Um, uh, you know, we, unlike just a regular class in Java or Python, we're actually building this like in-memory tree that represents the graph of your application. Um, and we do this, you know, for a number of reasons. One is just to kind of give these stable names for cloud resources that will be uh, uh, like stable names across compilations. But a consequence of this is that, um, you know, you can create all of these, uh, you know, instances of classes, you know, from different libraries and create a cloud queue. Um, and these, basically end up forming a tree of resources. So all of, all three of these classes are implicitly, right, injected. They're basically implicitly children of the root of the application. Um, and then these themselves might have their own resources, right? So each cache has its own bucket. So um, I don't have a great way to draw it, but you can imagine there's like a root. I mean, you, you, you could use the console. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, that's actually a great point. Uh, okay, so so yeah, we have to give each thing a name. Let's do that. <laughs> I don't know how to to visualize this idea. <laughs> <laughs> if only there was a way. Oh my god! If only there was a way to like represent the tree. <laughs> and so here we have it. It's, it's we actually amazing. have the tree right also on the on the pane on the left hand side. Uh, yeah, uh, how does, I don't know if I've actually Just used open it, it and you'll see it. It's, it's kind of weird. Uh, right? Okay. Here we go. Right. So the, here's the tree of resources. So inside of the first cache, there's a bucket inside of the second cache, there's another bucket and so on. Um, but your point was that there's a single root basically, right? Yeah, there's a single root. And so there's this question of like, once you have files with multiple projects with multiple files, like, are they all just kind of implicitly adding things to the root. Um, I think the issue is that it kind of gets messy, right? Um, um, so I think it's not just about getting messy. I, sh I also think it's like, uh, you know, a bit more philosophical, right? When you're creating a module, th there is a concept of entry points in programs. Right? right, C has a main function. Java has a main function, right? Like Go has, Rust has a, also main? How is it called in Rust? Yes, uh, also main. Yeah. Also main. And so this idea of, a, of an entry point is, is, exists in all programming languages. In most of them, it's not part of the language or part of the you know, syntax in a sense. It's, it's kind of like a convention that t tells uh, the compiler, what is the main entry point? What is the entry point of the program? And that's exactly the same thing with Wing, right? Like, I feel like there's an entry point, there's a root, and and from that root, there's a tree, and there's a single root, and there can't be multiple roots, right? Like, that's a... 
Right. Yeah. Like if you have, if you have a Python program with two main, yeah, it doesn't make sense. You, you, usually the language requires just one main function. So exactly. Exactly. Um, so in wing, it's basically this entry point file. Yeah. So the entire file is just, we, we treat it as an entry point file. Um, and then everything that's not an entry point file, you can just only define, you can declare things, but you can't, you know, instantiate them at the global scope. Right. And that's the main difference. Yeah. So. And there, so there are also no like un, uh, unexpected side effects. I think JavaScript might, JavaScript has this problem where you can actually write code at the root of every file. And then you require that file and code is executed as you import the file right into your code. And that could create side effects. And those side effects could be hazardous in cloud systems, right? Like you could potentially imagine a situation where a library or a model would create a resource that would cost you a million dollars a month and you wouldn't even notice, right? Or yeah, hopefully... unless you have the Win console, but <laughs> unless you have the Win console. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah no it's a yeah side effects it's just also just like hard to mental like it creates more things you have to kind of track in your mind like oh if i import this thing before that thing then it changes Correct. what happens like we don't like that yeah and we do have some you 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 added some uh protection against cyclic dependencies which i think is another uh yep yeah um yeah there's all kinds of issues with like i mean yeah it's graphs. <laughs> it's all graphs. Um, yeah. Cool, cool. This is exciting. I mean, again, I think that it's definitely something that uh, is tailed by table six. We can't, uh, we can't, uh, we can't call this a useful programming language without supporting something like that. I think the next step is libraries, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, like. Yeah, when you think of modules, like, I mean, we, we have these multiple file projects. Um, you know, what, what, what does a module do, do for you? I mean, one thing is you're using it to just kind of organize your code, like group together different resources. Um, you know, a really important thing is like when you have really big code bases, maybe you want to have a class with the same name, you know, in a different folder because you don't want to have to deal with all these naming collisions. Modules help you with that. Um, so in some sense, they're kind of a unit of composition. The other part is that modules let you package your code and share it with others, right? And, and the, the basic inter, uh, interface in Wing is that a module represents, you know, uh, a collection of classes, structs, enums, and interfaces, right? Um, so yes. that's what we're working on. Uh, you, you meant a library, right? A library, right. <laughs> yeah, package, <laughs> library, I mean... Uh, yeah, so we have modules, which are kind of like a local file that you bring, and the library is a way to package a module, basically, and, and distribute it, right? So it's kind of like, it's still exactly. a module. Yeah, cool. and it's 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 something we're working on. Like, I think. What about like ver you know, versioning, like package managers, stuff like that. Right. So, once we start, yeah, sharing these modules, these libraries, um, yeah, a lot of there's a lot of complexity, and this is like, this is what software engineering has become, right? Like, it's managing all these dependencies. How can we make it? easier, smoother. Um, I think for Wing, you know, we're thinking about this both from the ground up and also just pragmatically. Um, initially, we're, yeah, thinking of starting right with uh, basically packaging your library as an NPM module. So um, kind of like how CDK libraries were all NPM modules, it'll be the same thing. Um, but, but yeah, that will kind of let you resolve dependencies using existing like semantic versioning and other mechanisms like that. Um, so you set so basically if using you make a breaking change. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, yeah, if you make a breaking change, <laughs> <laughs> it will, you'll do a major version bump and so on. Yeah. Okay. But as sorry. Uh, 
yeah. So basically, using npm as a package manager, like that's the that's the original think that's the initial thinking. Um, and so package JSON files and npm install and everything else, right? Yeah, I, I've actually already started like kind of incubating this a little bit. Like, okay, let's see now I'm curious. This. Um, actually, let, let's just try. Okay, let, let's actually see if this works. I know. <laughs> Let me. Uh, I haven't tried multi-file projects. Oh, oh it, it it should work though maybe. Um, so if I write. Oh, I called it pack just to be. Uh, all right, we, we want to. Nice. Here it's like asking you to just create a package JSON because we're kind of building off of that. It kind of makes sense. If you're using any dependencies, you already need a package JSON today. So right, any like oh, might CDK, de CDK dependencies. Right, right. Um, and then once you've done that. Um, Right, we have this kind of convention where maybe there's like a an entry point for your library, um, because we need to know like wh like here there's two files, main and store. Like what what are we actually packaging up? Like what what's the first thing that people import? Um, so although mm, interesting, so will it just have internal brains basically? Because we're anyway we it's an interesting thing. Uh, because yeah, if it's there, there's some if design it's collection. Needed. If it's a collection, then it's a collection, right? Like it doesn't matter. There's no, there's no tree, right? In this use uh, case. Right. Yeah, we could like also could say like star star dot uh, w, right? Like just give me like a bunch of w files and and it'll bring uh, bring all their dependencies as well. But uh, you can have multiple entry points te theoretically. Yeah, theoretically, yeah. I think uh, yeah, definitely doable. Um, although sometimes it's good to like have some way to say like, okay, I just have a bunch of modules, uh, module files. These are private. These are public. Um, we need some kind of mechanism for that. But, but yeah, we'll we'll figure out the right thing. Um, in any, either case, here we can just kind of like rename it. I guess. I'll name it lib, and then let's try packing it, and we get a tarball. So, no. And what's in inside the tarball? Oh, he had to ask. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's just the things you expect. Like, okay, so here's we don't want to package target, so I, I need to work on that. But it's the wing files as well as you know any JavaScript you're relying on. Um, Show me. I can't see it actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's just, is... just next to. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I, I would like open my finder. Um, okay, so there's like an index file that that, that has what? Uh, so this is just like I think a convention of like npm libraries. Like, you need. Um, oh, you need an index file. You need like a main to point to yeah, something. I think uh, I got it. I think maybe we can like uh, emit a an error or a console log or something, right? Like some side effect maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that's wow. That's a that's controversial, man. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Um, and yeah, okay. then, uh, then basically the files. two W files. The two W files. Yep. Nice. Okay. Uh, Can you consume it already? Uh, not yet. Work oh. work in progress. Ah, but wow, I'm not, I'm so excited by this by this. Okay, I'm uh, getting a signal that we're like way way late, which is to be expected, given AI is not here. Um, Chris, always a pleasure. Uh, please come more. And can't wait to play with the libraries and modules and start publishing. I'm constantly having some ideas. And I was like, I wish I could just like publish more libraries. It's like, you know, litter the world. With like junk I, I saw how many libraries you published on the CDK team. I, I, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I like. I really want. I really want that. It's also a way for me not to like to get in the to not get in the way and like just like kind of publish stuff. That's. I feel like it's uh, it's very exciting too. Cool. Oh, so thanks cool. so much. Uh, have a uh, done do. Are we doing like the? Okay. So, bye. Bye, everyone. Shooters. Yeah!
Get 